Welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast. Today's guest is Philip Mott, and he is an educator. He is an expert at this. He's got college, he's got studying, and he's got experience, especially in the field of homeschooling. Now, we're living in an age where a lot of people are very, very seriously considering and opting in to homeschooling their kids. Now, I know it might not be for everybody, and some of you may still have to send your kids away to a, some kind of school, but maybe we can still learn something if we take responsibility for our kids' education. Let's talk to Philip about that. We're gonna get into it right after this. You can be a man of courage, of honor, of integrity. You can be the father, the husband, the leader that your family and your community needs. This is the Manlyhood Mancast. Here's your host, Josh Hatcher. Guys, thank you for tuning into the Manlyhood Mancast. Listen, I'm your host, your founder of the Manlyhood Movement, Josh Hatcher, and I am so excited to have you guys watching, listening to the podcast today. This matters to me, guys. This is my passion. It is my passion to help men like you, men like me, become better men. There are so many ways that our society has abandoned us has turned their back on the idea that a man is a good thing. I don't buy into the idea of playing the victim. I don't want to say that society has uh, cast us down and we need to overthrow feminism. And I'm not going to get into all of that. I think there's just a bunch of nonsense that you get into when you go that route. What I am going to say is this. We have to take responsibility to be the men that we're supposed to be. We're going to band together, we're going to grow, and we're going to learn to be better men. That's not that difficult. It's not that hard. It's not wrong. It doesn't demean women. It doesn't. To say, men, regardless of what culture says, regardless of what anybody says, we're going to be good men and we're going to do it together. That's what manlyhood is about. And if you believe in that, and if you support that, I want you to share this episode or any episode. I want you to tell a friend. I want you to leave this podcast a review on iTunes. I want you to comment. I want you to subscribe. All of the things so that we can help Manlyhood become more than just your friend with a podcast. Let's make this a movement, guys. Listen, go to the Manlyhood store, buy a t-shirt. You just go to manlyhood.com slash store and you can help represent. Okay? I love you guys. We're going to get into this great conversation with educator and homeschooler, Philip Mott. Hey, Phil, it's really good to have you on the show, my friend. I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got to say and hear about your journey. Uh, it seems like you're doing some really interesting work, and I, I think our audience would really love to hear about that. So maybe tell me a little bit about what it is that you do and, and how... Uh, how this kind of developed, if you could. Yeah, Josh, thanks for having me on and um, looking forward to catching out more of the, the podcasts that you've been doing. Um, so uh, I live with my family uh, near Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, spent my whole childhood and adulthood here. Uh, been married for close to 15 years and we have a seven-year-old, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And uh, we are homeschoolers of a certain kind of breed. Uh, we could call ourselves unschoolers and unschoolers pride themselves on uh, not having a set curriculum to follow. And as a former, as a former elementary teacher myself, uh, you would think that I would be all about curriculum, but it was actually some of my experiences in the classroom that led me to believe that the the curriculums that we're putting kids through are doing a lot more harm than good. And it's, it's putting tension on the relationships between parents and their kids. 
and between teachers and kids. And so we practice what's called unschooling, um, which is a lot like it sounds. It's, um, it's the opposite of what you imagine, what, what you might remember school being. Uh, so the kids spend their days playing um, with each other and pursuing their, old in- their own interests. Sometimes that means coloring. Sometimes that means computer games. Sometimes that means uh, playing with Pokemon cards. Uh, But in that process, they're also uh, learning a lot more about, a lot about how life works and and how to manage their own time. We had a similar process for our kids. We actually went to a virtual charter school when our kids were coming up. Uh, They're all graduated now, except for the last one who, her last two years she wanted to go to the public school which we are doing with lots of hesitation (laughs) but um you know we used the virtual charter school which gave us curriculum which was helpful actually and as it started it was more like here's curriculum and someone to keep track over time it kind of became more hands-on teacher um which honestly as our life progressed for us that worked really well but we kind of supplemented that education with a lot of unschooling on the side. And um, I wished that we would have been in a position or maybe brave enough, maybe that's a better word, brave Mm -hmm. enough to do it that way. Um, Because I'll tell you what, man, I was a a different kid. I didn't learn like everybody else, you know, like I was bored to tears in the classroom and I, like I had good grades, so nobody noticed, but man, it was wreaking havoc on me just so I get it. Like there that concept of, of, Hey, let's do this different. So what prompted you to say, here's our kids. I have this idea. Let's just break the mold here and let's do this our own way. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, I think the journey really started back in my teacher preparation, uh, in college, we were shown a documentary called including Samuel, which was a story about a young boy named Samuel, with cerebral palsy and his family's journey to try to make sure that he felt accepted and part of the normal classroom. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but before much of the, um, much of the movements in the late eighties to early nineties, a lot of kids with special needs were not allowed in the regular classroom. They were kept in separate rooms. And sometimes, you know, as people from our generation might recognize the stereotype, they rode the short bus. They Mm -hmm. actually went to a different school a lot of times um, and were treated very differently. And so it has been a fight for people with disabilities to get their kids and get themselves into the normal classroom. And that's what this movie was about. And Of course, in their school, it was becoming more of a norm that kids with disabilities were actually included, but there still had to be a lot of accommodations made. And what this movie helped me realize was that the, that the schools have been made with kids in mind, but often they are not treated, they are treated as if the, the, kids are there to serve the students or this to serve the school's needs. You know, they're not treated as participants in their education. They're kind of treated as like the product. And that, that really made me more open to a more child directed um, type of model. And it was, it had been, It was several years later after I spent time in the classroom and time as a, as a virtual school teacher, I actually taught online for four years. Um, It's, it took that experience before I finally learned that what we wanted to do in our hearts, there was a name for it there. We found the unschooling community and realized, oh, this is something people do that there, there are kids who live their lives free from school and they make friends, they learn academic skills, they go on to work jobs. They don't become 
uh, feral and, you know, alone children that you might imagine them being. Um, does that fully answer that question for you? It actually really does. It was a great answer for that. It, it's funny because um, just the whole concept of feral children, it just makes me think, um, I'll tell you a quick story that you might be interested in. But one day, you know, my kids, when they were doing virtual school, especially early on when they had more kind of, we kind of had a little bit more, I don't want to say control, but a little bit more freedom with, if they got their classwork done, they were done. You know, they didn't have to sit in the instruction at early on. It's very asynchronous. So they would sometimes get their work done on Monday and be done for the rest of the week. All they had to do was just check in. So um, my kids would just roam the woods. You know, we live in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. They just roam the woods. And I remember one day I smelled smoke and I'm like, what is that? And I go outside and I look and my daughter, whose um, primary source of education was Little House on the Prairie, was dressed up outside with a long dress and a bonnet. And she had found some stones and she'd made a stone oven and she'd found wild onions growing and picked the wild onions, stole some butter from the house and, uh, and some matches and built a fire. She's like five or six, maybe nine. I don't know. She was really young. She's cooking wild onions on the stone oven that she built out in the woods. And I'm like, Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, honestly, I think she learned more in doing things like that than she would have ever learned stuck in a classroom. You know, I, so, so I totally get, I totally get the concept, man. Like there's, there's, there's a joy to it and yeah. right. Not to get too political, but right now it seems like there's a lot of parents across the country who were kind of forced in this situation where all of a sudden their kids are home. And now they're like, either in reaction to what they're finding out about the school and how things are happening either politically or whatever, or in just the fact that they enjoyed spending time with their kids, there's a shift again to maybe we ought to think about this. Like, how do you, do you see that happening? Have you had a lot of interest or people asking you questions kind of in this new post COVID world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, w I think I want to come back to that and, and say that one of the messages that I have for, um, for parents is that they, they don't have to choose one or the other. They don't have to say, they don't have to like forsake school and, and do homeschooling or unschooling. Um, I'm a big believer that they can, they can do unschooling outside of the school walls. And in a lot of ways, families are doing that without even realizing it. Um, because, and to follow one of my, one of my favorite friends, uh, definition of unschooling is unschooling is just the way that people learn outside of school. It's not the way that kids learn outside of school. It's the way that everyone learns outside of school. You find something that's interesting in the world and you read about it, or you watch a video, or you ask a person, or you try it, or you do all of those things. And that's essentially what unschooling is. The, when you're talking about the, the, the situation that we've been in with COVID, yeah, I think people were all of a sudden found themselves at home and the, the parents who became aware like keenly aware of like how frustrated they were with their kids all the time and how, how hard it is to actually like teach and instruct. And so they became a lot more open to let's do something totally different. Let's do something that doesn't feel like school felt to us. Uh, and of course, a lot of the older generations might say uh, boomers in particular they might be more inclined to say that we are, um, that we're enabling our kids and that, you know, school sucks, just deal with it. And that we're somehow making them soft, um, which I disagree with. I think unschooling is, is actually more difficult than like giving kids freedom is actually more difficult than telling them what to do all the time. Um, and it's more, it's more um, liber liberational, I think, uh, would be the word for it. Um, but 
but we have all these kind of uh, really authoritarian patterns that we build a lot of our life around and unschooling is a lot about dismantling some of those patterns. And instead of saying like, you know, it's my way or the highway, it's we're on this journey together. And you as my child, even though you're only five or you're only seven, uh, you have something to say too. And that doesn't mean we have to agree with it, that I have to do everything that they say to do, but I can take time to consider it. And yeah, that's a good thing. What does a typical day look like for an unschooling family like yours? That's a good question. Um, and, and it's a hard question to answer because it's, um, I think it's hard to describe. We wake up at different times. We generally eat breakfast together. Uh, yeah, I work here from home. And so we're around each other almost 24-7. Uh, my wife works from home as well. And we kind of do little handoffs. You know, sometimes I'm doing lunch and my wife is working and I'm kind of doing tech support for the kids as they become more independent on devices. Um, and then sometimes we get into rabbit holes where they're like, well, I want to do this. And it involves a trip to the store or it involves um, a trip through uh, YouTube videos or it just involves a long process of sitting there with them and helping them with something. And, uh, and that's our main thing. Our, our main routines are, are revolve around meals and then everything else is, you know, the kids are doing their own thing and we're trying to make sure that we have the time to do what we need to do. Um, but I know other unschooling families where both of the parents work outside of the home and they actually have different shifts or they, or their divorced families where they split time between homes and, and even the, the parent, one of the parents is not on board with unschooling. So the kids go to school, but the mom does things differently. So there's a lot of different situations where it's hard to describe exactly how we live. And I wouldn't want to imply that unschooling goes this way. It's just, this is the way that it's happening for us right now. Um, you know, there might be a time where I get a different job and I'm working outside of the house and that would drastically change the way we do things. And then of course, as the kids get more mobile, you know, we don't live in an area where there's any sort of public transit. So, um, you know, if they're going to go anywhere on their own in the next few years, it's going to be on foot or on a bike. Um, but they'll be allowed to, you know, go to a park by themselves or with each other, or, um, I may go to a park with them or, and things like that, but that would drastically change if I worked in an office setting. When we first started our journey, I was working from home. My wife was, was full time at home with them. And, um, we would frequently have like, Hey, let's go on a field trip today, you know? And we'd go to, uh, you know, for that was a big endeavor because we live in the middle of nowhere. So if we wanted to go see a museum or something, we had quite a drive, but we would take road trips all the time or go to a state park or, or go somewhere and just find something to do. And, um, it was always an adventure, you know? And honestly, like those memories are things like, dude, spelling drove me nuts. Teaching the kids how to spell drove me crazy, but you know what? Teaching them about, Hey, look, like this is a giraffe, <laughs> you know, yeah. those were awesome memories that, that we always will have, you know, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, the, so much of the learning that happens outside of school is, is really the most fun stuff and it's the easiest stuff to teach. What we found and a lot of unschoolers will argue this is that um, the people who say, well, we, we need to teach kids the basics, they're actually wrong. Uh, the basics are called basics because they're everywhere. You can't avoid them. Um, some kids learn to read by playing video games. Some kids learn to read by playing board games. Some kids learn to read because their parents read them books all the time. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to learn how to read and learn how to spell, to use your example. 
mm-hmm. um, but there's not many ways to learn how to use a hammer or um, how to navigate your surroundings, your neighbor. Like you have to just go out and do it. Um, and you have to read street signs and uh, you have to read instructions on how to put things together. So reading is everywhere. And if you have, if you're a kid and you have parents who can read, there's like a 99.5% chance that you're going to read. And it may look like someone taught you how to read, but it's not very clear how kids actually learn to read. Uh, And I'll give, I'll use my son as an, as an example, Uh, except for a few phonics lessons that we tried that we did at breakfast we never taught him how to read. We never like quizzed him on words. Uh, we never had him sound things out. Um, and it was sometime last year, he was really into looking at all these, they're called who would win books. They pair different animals together and pretend they have a fight. He loved looking at the pictures. And one night he said, does anyone want to hear me read this book? And I was like, yeah, I do. I hadn't heard him read yet. He was six and not only did he read it, but there wasn't any like stumbling. It was, it sounded like me reading or his mom reading. And I was like, Oh, he's reading now. I didn't teach him that. How did he learn this? Like, how did he figure that out? And unschoolers across the world have similar experiences. Like I didn't teach him how to read. He just learned it. He, he was he was reading clocks by the time he was three, both analog and digital. We taught him that, but not in a lesson setting. Like he would just ask us what time it was and we'd point at the clock and say, it's this time. And then we might explain like the hands or we, the numbers and stuff. Well, um, they le- start learning multiplication that way too, you know? Absolutely. And so all of those things that we try to teach kids in school, especially in the first four or five years, those things are present in our everyday lives and they learn those things almost through osmosis. So if that can happen in the unschooling setting, it makes me wonder why we spend so many resources in schools kind of drilling this stuff into their head, um, you know, sending negative notes home to parents, sending kids to the office for not listening. Why are we doing that when there are kids that are learning this stuff without even being taught? without even, without punishing them, they're learning how to read. So why are we punishing kids for not reading in school? And, and, you know, it kind of goes back to some of your story about yourself. Like it, what does a kid start to tell themselves when they're in second grade and the only adult besides that their, their parents that they really know is their teacher and the teacher is shaming them because they're behind in reading. What does it, what kinds of stories does a child begin to tell themselves about themselves when they're treated in this way? On top of that, that doesn't even factor in the bullying and the, the other things that go on from peer to peer. And, you know, if I look back on my own school experience as a kid, I mean, it was pretty bad. I mean, I had, bullying from my first week of school, even from teachers, you know, and, um, you know, my wife and I both had that kind of experience. And I remember both, she was, my wife was left-handed and they tried to teach her to write right-handed. Like this was like the eighties, like that should not have still been a thing, you know, that should have all like, that's like common knowledge at that point that people could be left-handed and they put her in a special class to teach her how to write right-handed and would like you know, pull her out of class and like treat her like she had a learning disability because she couldn't write right-handed, like, you know, and, and that had an impact on her the rest of her life, you know, Absolutely. I, I'm not saying that the school system can't do good things, but man, like when we had our kids, we're like, I think we're going to be the crazy ones that, that do this at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you can relate to that because that's kind of where you guys are. So, yeah. And in defense of teachers, you know, teachers really care. They really do. They love the kids that they're with and they are put in a position where by administrators and by some of the norms of our culture to get results 
out of kids before the kids are ready. And it wears the teachers down. It really does. And it, and there's a lot of teachers that I'm connected with on social media. Um, and we have a lot of conversations about, you know, how do I, this teacher is asking, how do I work in this public system? And I believe in self-directed education. I believe in unschooling, but I need a job. And how do I do this? How do I work in this system that doesn't believe in it? And, and I love these kids and I love their families and I want to see the best for them, but I'm not like allowed to deliver what I think is best for them, which is trust and respect instead of quizzes and homework. I 100% have seen that. My daughter actually went to college to be a teacher mm -hmm. and she made it all the way to like her senior year. And she's like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. <laughs> and then she became a successful insurance agent and didn't even finish college. She spent all that time and yeah. money. And she's like, I'm not even going to, why am I wasting any more money on this? Why am I wasting any more time on this? I don't like this. I don't like, yeah. she, you know, when she started doing the, the hands-on stuff in the schools, you know, with the classrooms, she's like, I thought this was going to be very different. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, her, her work with kids is now, you know, done in the church setting, you know, where she gets to kind of mentor and love kids in that setting and, um, and in the community kind of setting. And then she's about to have a baby of her own. So, you know, awesome. she's like, that's where she's going to be investing in kids. And she's perfectly content with that, you know, it, so which you're going to be a grandpa. I am. I'm really excited yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's kind of sad because I do think that she would be an amazing teacher, but I fully understand and respect her choice to say, this is not what I was hoping it would be. The system is broken and I know that I can't change it from the bottom. So I think I'm out, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I know that you're, a lot of your audience is men and fathers. And I think, you know, the fathers have typically held maintain more of a backseat when it comes to learning. And uh, some of that I think is better. Um, you know, moms kind of go through this, this mom guilt trip where they constantly feel like they have to be just pushing their kids and like they have to be super involved in all the educational stuff. And some dads have more of a hands-off approach, which I think is actually better even though the dad is made to feel by the, by the culture that they need to be more involved and they feel some shame toward that, but they really don't know how to be involved. And I think some of my message to them would just be that you're doing more than you realize, like, you know, just being around your kids, just sharing things that you're doing, even if what you like to do is watch sports in your free time, like there's learning happening in that as well. Now, all are all of the lessons that they're learning great? Not necessarily. You know, if you're yelling and cussing at the TV, you know, that may not be the, the best lesson for them, but they are learning something. They're learning, they're learning what's important to you. Sure. And they're well, learning about things that are important in the culture. If if they're watching football, they're learning, you know, math seven and seven is 14, you know, plus an extra point is, <laughs> is 15, you know, or a field goal is, is plus three, you know I mean? There, so there's, but there's an opportunity to, to talk about that with your young kids and talk about the math or to talk about the language or the cultures, you know, you're playing basketball and you've got, you know, a player from China, you know, or something that, that's happening. And, and yeah, it, I think that the, the shift, especially for dads, maybe in taking the time to understand that every moment there's teachable stuff happening. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to teach in every moment, but you know, you got to work on the car. You know, I think this is kind of the stereotypical dad moment, right? Hold this flashlight while I work on the car. Right. Yeah. You know, that's also another moment where you could be teaching them some bad words. So you want to be careful, <laughs> but um, that's also a really good moment to teach them about a lot of things, you know, where I think, like for me, there's a lot of times where I had a project to do and it was just easier to do it alone. And if I could go back, I would have brought my kids along with me. I would have said, oh, I should have had them help me with this because if they did, they would have learned that skill. But instead I wanted to get it done quick, you know? Yeah. Cause we have limited amount of time 
And, um, and it is harder, you know, it'll, it'll test your patience, it'll push your buttons. Um, and I'm not advocating that the, that dads do everything with their kids. Um, but I challenge myself daily to stop and pause, like, well, what can we do together? You know, just because I want to go on a bike ride doesn't mean the kids want to, and I shouldn't make them. But if I want to go on a bike ride and one of them does want to come, maybe I should let them um, because, because they want to enjoy time with me or they want to go see something or they want to do something physical. And, um, you know, every time I check the, the water softener, I don't have to bring them all along. Like, all right, we're checking the water softener. This is important. You got to make sure the water is soft enough. I don't know if you guys have that problem in Pennsylvania. We have really hard water here. Um, we actually don't have it where we live in Pennsylvania, but other places in the state we do. We actually have really good water here because again, we're yeah. in the middle of nowhere. So it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's nice, yeah. fresh, clean water, but <laughs> it's, uh, we're pretty rural too, but it's just, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of iron in the, in the soil here. So yeah, anyway. Um, so it's not like, it's not like I drag my kids along with everything, but a lot of times they're curious. Sometimes it's the three-year-old. Sometimes it's the seven-year-old. Sometimes it's all three of them. We were on an errand uh, a couple of weeks ago and I said, well, I just gotta, I gotta go to the post office and check our PO box. Um, and and the kids wanted to come in. I'm like, guys, it's literally like two, two minutes. Like, I'm just going to walk in there, open a door, see if there's anything in there and then close it. And they're like, all three of them are like, no, I want to go. <laughs> so I got to get everybody out of the car, um, walk everybody in, put on, put our masks on, open the door. There's nothing in there. I come back and uh, I think the oldest said, well, that wasn't very fun. I was like, what did you, I, I told you exactly what to expect. Like it was not supposed to be fun, but you wanted to come. And uh, of course I could have just said, no, I'm going in by myself, but we were all together and I thought, yeah, you can come in. So it took an extra, a trip that should have taken two minutes. Max took 10 minutes <laughs> right. to get everybody out of the car and back in. I don't know why I got off on that a little bit, but yeah, just talking about just the things that we do with our kids. And does that mean they needed, did they need a post office lesson? No, but they, but that doesn't mean they learned nothing. You know, if, if they come to a point in their life where they need a, a post office box or they need to go to the post office, they're a little bit more comfortable with the post office because they've been there. You know, and sometimes that comfort level, and just like you were talking about working on a car with our dads, you know, the only reason I feel like I know how to do anything with cars is all the times that I held a flashlight for my dad working on cars. You know, my wife didn't do that. And she, she won't even open the hood. She, <laughs> right. feels, she feels no level of comfort when it comes to that. And the fact that I spent so much time around cars because my dad did work on our cars um, to save money and because that was an, an area of interest of his. Um, if there's a problem with the car, I feel like I can open some things and do some diagnostic beyond just like, oh, I just need to call anybody else. Um, and I think those things are important. And it's part of the reason that I know my way around the kitchen because my mom cooked a lot and I watched her. She didn't give me cooking lessons. She didn't say, this is a skill you need to learn. It's just, there were five of us kids. It was the only time we got to talk to her. So if I wanted to talk to mom, she was in the kitchen and I ended up watching her and we had most of our best conversations while she was preparing meals. As our kids were getting ready to kind of leave the house, my wife kind of had one of those panic moments one day when she was asking the boys something. The girls always cooked. I mean, from the time they were frying onions in the backyard, you know, but yeah. um, the um, the boys, she just realized one day that like, they don't know anything. They know how to make ramen noodles and that's it. Open a can or whatever, you know, ramen noodles, they could always make something, but they didn't know how to actually make a meal. And so she's, she panicked. She's like, they're going to go out into the real world and not be able to survive. 
she's like, okay, I'm going to teach them. And so I remember she, she talked to my son, Abe, especially Abe. And she was like, all right, they're, you're super picky. And there's only certain foods that you like, what foods do you want to learn how to make? You know? And he's like 15, 16, wants nothing to do with this, you know? And he's, she's like, look, you need to know how to make this. She's like, okay. So, so she kind of instituted one day a week, you guys are cooking thing in the house. And so, so she took the time, probably took about a month and all of his favorite foods, he learned how to cook. And I'm going to tell you what I went over to, he's now 18, actually, no, he's 19 turning 20. And I went over to his house and, um, we had a guy's night over there and I were like, Hey, what do you guys want to have? And, and they're like, let's make tacos. Like I got it. We went over. I mean, he made taco meat and I'm not talking like by like the seasoning at the store. I mean, like he seasoned the meat from scratch, you know, with the yeah. perfect ingredient, you know, and I'm like, these are better than hers. And he was like, thanks dad. That's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, like there's something to that, you know, like you, you pass on things and they learn things and, you know, my son can make pretty good tacos. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot of my thing with, you know, I write a, a, a monthly column for a magazine called first time parent magazine. I write for an organization called fatheringtogether.org. And that one of the reasons they brought the, both of those organizations brought me in to do more writing is because I'm, I'm always interested in those sort of like fringe activities that, we do without thinking about it. And it's like, I want to help the reader understand that these are more valuable than you think they are. Like the, the sitting in the kitchen, making spaghetti together, it's more valuable than what you, what we traditionally think of as thought like parent child interactions. And, um, for example, like some parents really think I have to be at my kids' games, their, their competitive games. I have to be at every game. And I feel like that is less important than the, the little two minute to 15 minute interactions you have between things. And, um, and it's, I don't know, it's just, I think those things are overlooked so often. And sometimes those activities, like teaching a kid how to cook, I think they are often avoided because it's messy. It's not fun to watch your kid break eggs and get (laughs) egg all over the place. (laughs) We do every week, we do what we call a big breakfast and, you know, smoked sausage, scrambled eggs, hash browns, biscuits, and the kids are invited to help to whatever level that they feel ready to. We started this about, I want to say about a year and a half ago. And at that point, you know, the, the five and a half year old, he couldn't break eggs. Of course, it was his first time. It was just everywhere. It's just like dripping down his arms and, uh, but, and we're pulling out half of eggshells out of the pan, you know, to make sure there's not in there. And, uh, but now he's doing it by himself. He's doing the eggs by himself. He's stirring them and he can tell when they're done. And, you know, it's just uh, this, this comfort level with things in the kitchen. It, it doesn't happen by accident. Sometimes it happens by accident, but it's like, like we're not teaching him how to work in the kitchen, but he's learning it. We made a point to, if we went out to eat, and the waitress asks what you, we taught them very young, you have to order your food. You know, if we went to a store and they wanted to buy something, I'd give them the money and they would go up and buy it. So, you know, this little five-year-old kid would go up and use their manners and they would count out their money. And like, that is something that, like, I know so many like young adults who have anxiety about that kind of stuff because nobody ever taught them or allowed them to do it. And, you know, we're like, no, we're going to teach our kids very young that this is important. And, And they still like, they still had anxiety about it. They still hate to do it, but they did it, you know, and they know how to do it, you know, or if they had to make a phone call, you know, when, when they were in school, they'd have to make a phone call to tech support, you know, oh, they hated that. But like, look, you've got to do it. Like you've got to learn how to do this. (laughs) You know, we could call for you, but then you're not going to learn it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't like making those calls. There's, there's things that, that I get uneasy uh, as an almost 40 adult. And, um, that's, 
that's part of life. You know, it's, trying new things is not easy or fun always. Um, and, you know, my only caveat to that, I think, is that uh, I try to I try to make sure that my kids understand that and that it's okay to be upset when you're anxious about something like um, even, even losing in a board game is like, that's okay to be upset about that. It just means you care that you care about the game. You care about winning. I mean, that's, I, I think we all feel that way. None of us like to lose. Um, and, you know, when I was a kid, the adults, in my life would try to shame kids for being upset about things. And I still see older generations do that. They talk about millennials like us and say, you, you know, you're so soft, you know, you can't handle any challenges. It's like, well, you wouldn't let us handle them. You would tell us how to handle them when we were growing up and you wouldn't let us kind of figure it out, figure out our own emotions. You always told us how to feel about what we were going through and that, and no matter how we felt, it was almost always wrong. I mean, I don't know if that's your experience a lot too, but you know, no matter how we felt growing up, a lot of times it was just wrong. It's like, Nope, you're not allowed to feel that way. Well, I'm a Gen X. I'm, I'm just over the line. So we always have a little bit different view than you millennials. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, there is something very true that to that. And I, like, I love to, it's, I would always tell my kids, it's okay to be upset about this. It's not okay to scream your head off in the grocery store. So you got to keep it under control. (laughs) You know, like it's, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to cry. It's not okay to scream at the top of your lungs right now, you know? And that was always a challenge because they never, they couldn't hear me over the screaming, but I tried. Yeah. (laughs) That's that screaming can get pretty loud. It's like, I I can't even hear myself think, let alone hear myself talk. (laughs) It was usually over something dumb, like making them wear something that wasn't stretchy pants, you know? So, yeah, (laughs) but that's kids. Although if I had my way, I think I'd only wear stretchy pants now. So (laughs) I'm, yeah, I mostly wear, uh, wear, um, mesh shorts every day. There you go. They're comfortable, especially in the summertime. Definitely. So, uh, in this journey of unschooling, you know, I know that there's a lot of dads and and a lot of parents who the idea of doing that as their child's education is just unrealistic. They know that that's not going to work for them. I love that you're saying it doesn't have to be these core of your child's education, but I think you're saying no matter where you're at, you can still do it. And it's important for you to do it. Right. Is that kind of the gist of, of your message? Yeah, it's, uh, it's important that you do it. And it's kind of important that you recognize that you're already doing it uh, for yourself. Like this is the way you learn. Um, and, and it's important that you extend that right to your kids. Um, and that you kind of remember the way it felt to be put down as a child and to commit to exploring a way that you might interact with children that doesn't require you to put them down for the things that they love. And, and that this is just that unschooling is not some, it's not some weird way of instructing. It's, it's just, it's just living. Um, It's just living life with our kids. And a lot of times that means sacrificing the power that we think we have over them. And it's important that we talk about the power that we think we have, because we don't actually have that power. We think we have control over the kind of person that they become, but you and I have both seen families that try to exert that power too much and it comes out sideways and, and the kids rebel, um, you know, in, in sometimes very dangerous ways. And so that's something that's very important for dads to be aware of is that the, that there is no control that we have over our children, that that's an illusion. And so aligning ourselves to a different way of thinking where we think if I don't have control, then what does that mean for the way that I interact with my children? 
That doesn't mean I have zero influence. I have a lot of influence over my kids' lives, but I don't control them in a way that I feel like I should be able to sometimes. I think that is really important. And you use the word influence, which I always, uh, John Maxwell says leadership is influence. And, and really that I think is the difference because control is saying, you will do what I say because I say to do it, which sometimes, listen, the, the right answer, I do believe this. Sometimes the right answer is because I said so. I mean, there, maybe not all the time and probably less than you think it is, <laughs> but there are times when it's like, th- that's just the answer sometimes. But um, leadership is, is knowing and understanding that role is to say, I'm going to lead you, which means I'm going to influence you. And it also recognizes and understand their own personal sovereignty. They have a choice to make, you know, and there are consequences to those choices. And you may have some responsibility in, in making those consequences happen, or sometimes those consequences will happen on their own. So sometimes you have to let them happen. And that's a little easier in the teenage years because it just happens. You know what I mean? There, those consequences, you can't stop them most of the time. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And you don't, you, you don't want to. Um, you wish you could save them from some of the consequences, but you, you really don't want to stop those consequences. I have a couple questions that I like to ask all of my guests. Yeah, and absolutely. The, the first one is what happens if, if, you know, if we use our imaginations, let's put our thinking caps on for a minute and uh, young Philip walks in the room, you know, he's six to 10 years old, somewhere in that line, along that line. And, You've got the opportunity to speak into his life, to tell him something that he needs to know. What's that going to be? Yeah. Um, the, I feel like this is more uh, applicable to an older me, but it's, it's really is the thing that comes to mind is that the, which I love imagining like meeting my young self. That's kind of a fun thing. Uh, but I would want to say most of what you enjoy in life will be the people you do the things with. So you're not going to, there's all kinds of things that I did, you know, up to this point in life. But when I look back on it, it's always the people I was with that I really remember, not necessarily the things that I did. So I think that's what I would want to tell him. And I would want, I would have, I would have wanted to be more aware of that growing up, that it was really going to become more about relationships that I was building than like the, the things that I was trying to do so much. I think that's a really good thought. That makes really good sense. And the next question is this for the men that are listening to this podcast today, what's the best advice that you have for them? And it doesn't have to be just one thing, but what's the best advice yeah. that you've got for them? It's the simplest idea I can think of is that learning doesn't happen in a straight line. It does, it's not A to B. And we've talked about that throughout the, throughout our conversation, but there's, um, you know, you might say, well, they're going to learn B by the end of today. And throughout the day, they're kind of winding in and out of the path and sort of backtracking, it looks like they're regressing um, and they're really not. And it doesn't, what looks like an apparent straight line to like, like just learning how to read is so much harder to identify because, um, and I'll use an example, like there's something about kids. I don't know if you remember this when your kids were little, but when they see a sibling come along, they, uh, the oldest one like will act like the younger sibling and they'll act like a baby. And it's tempting to think that they're regressing, but there's something about that experience that it's like researchers think that it's actually empathy, that they're, they're practicing taking on the, pers- the perspective of another and that that's a learning process. So it looks like they're regressing back into this, uh, younger state, but they're actually just off on a rabbit trail and their, cont- their mind is continuing to develop. So I would just, you know, try to help. I would try to encourage dads to see that 
what may look like a straight line to us, or we may think would be a straight line from A to B is actually very, very different than that. I think that's really good advice. Thanks. I know I've definitely seen that with my kids for sure. As they were growing up, I think I see it in my own life right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't always learn things from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, and you share, I love the story you share on your, uh, on your website about the, especially the weight loss journey is like, okay, I'm here. I'm heavier than I want to be. And I want to be here. That looks like a straight line, but you know that there's all these curves and all these, um, all these little like sidebars and, you know, back pain that you got to deal with. And it's like, well, what's that all about? And, and you're learning all kinds of different things on that pathway. And, um, and it's messy and it's frustrating. And sometimes you feel like you're not getting anywhere, but then you're, then you're all of a sudden there and you're like, Oh, how did I get here? And what did I learn along the way? And I, that's a, a lot of times what education is about. And, you know, people who want to try homeschooling, they think it's going to be like this systematic thing that you take your kids through. And, and we call that school at home, um, which is basically we're going to take what they do at school and we're going to do it at home. And we do not recommend that. And most people who, who do that, they either send their kids back to school because they burn out or they find some kind of way to be more personalized and they shape it to their kids a little bit more. Um, it's just not very sustainable. There are, there are of course some families who do do it and, um, and they blog about it and they share the, you know, thousands of dollars of curriculum that they purchase every year. And, um, you know, if that's working for them, I, I don't, you know, more power to them, I guess, but, uh, there's a lot of families that 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 just doesn't work for. Yeah. Nope. I fully understand it, man. Thank you. So Philip, if people want to follow the work that you're doing, if they want to kind of get plugged in with what you're doing, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. The best way is Twitter. I mean, I'm on Twitter. That's a great place to get connected with me and other unschoolers and homeschoolers uh, at Philip Mott one and Philip has one L if you want to keep if you actually want to read more of the, the how-to stuff and the informative articles, then my website is a good place to go, philipmott.com. Uh, and that's Philip with one L. Uh, I think the, the website with two L's is just an unknown domain. I don't think it's anything inappropriate, but you just won't find me there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so one L. We'll make sure we'll, we'll link that in the show notes if anybody wants to follow you and check out what you're doing. So, Perfect. Hey, I, I really appreciate your insights today, man. This was a great conversation and uh, likewise, and I appreciate you and the work you're doing, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Good luck on the podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Philip. I appreciate your insights into homeschooling so much. I know that that was my life for a long time as we, taught our kids from home. I worked from home for a lot of it. My wife worked from home for a lot of it. And it wasn't always easy, but our family grew up close together. And there's a lot of great and awesome memories. And I honestly think that they're worth it. My kids turned out to be great adults. And I believe that it was worth that investment. So if you're on the fence out there and you're considering, should I be involved? In my kids' education, should we homeschool? Maybe you shouldn't homeschool. That's okay. Maybe that's not for you, but you should be involved. You do have a responsibility as a father to teach, to be involved, to help. So take some time and figure out what that looks like. If you need some help, reach out to Phil and Philip and ask him some questions. Reach out to me. Ask me some questions. Check in with the guys in the Manlyhood Man Cave, our private Facebook group. These guys there would gladly talk about this and discuss it with you. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to the Manlyhood Mancast. I love you guys. I care about you. And I'll see you next time. If you want to be a better man, check out our website, manlyhood.com, for blogs, videos, and more from our Manlyhood team. Men, you can also join our private Facebook group, Manlyhood Man Cave, where you can meet up with a band of brothers who will challenge you and help you on your journey of manhood. 
This episode is produced by Hatcher Media for Manlyhood.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to the show. Tune in again for more of the Manlyhood Mancast.